Not one thing. It's not a defeat. Even death is not a defeat. It's just an open door to eternity. And so, God, we just thank you that we can walk as Christians knowing that there is no way that we can lose. We thank you for all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Give him a great big praise, will you? Go ahead and take a seat. You know, all of us, I think we understand this, but we need to be reminded of this every single day. The prize is not a good life. The prize is not money in the bank. The prize is not success in this world. Although we don't mind all those things, amen? We don't mind all those things. I want all those things, but that's not the prize. The prize is when we close our eyes in death and we open them and behold the object of our worship all these years, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I think the key to understanding this walk with God is to understand that we are only one breath away from heaven. One heartbeat away from heaven. That's how close it is. Sometimes we think heaven is a long, long way. I'm here to tell you it's not a long way. It's one breath away. And we need to live in this life. We need to live in this world in that way that we understand that we could be here in one moment and there in the next. And we need to not fear that. We need to embrace that. We need to ask ourselves the question, if the prize of our Christian walk is that first time that we gaze upon Jesus Christ, we need to ask ourselves the question, what if we were called upon today to leave this world? Would it cause excitement or would it cause fear? And that's a great gauge as to where we are at with the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we ready to meet Him, or is there a sense of fear on the inside? This morning, I want to preach a message that I'm entitling, Then You Will Know. Then You Will Know. There's so many things in this life that, that we, we think we know, or we, we have an idea of what would happen if certain things took place, but we don't really know until we get there. I remember when I was... A kid, a young man, I remember I would go out with my buddies on Friday night and, and I, there was a thing that I always wanted to do for some reason. I would load up my pocket with quarters and I'd always want to go over to the mall to the arcade, to the quarter arcade. Some, some of you guys don't even know what a quarter is anymore, you know, but you used to be able to go into the arcade at the mall and you used to be able to take a quarter and pop it in there and, uh, and play a video game. And there was a video game that I just loved to play all the time. It was the video game uh, called uh, Galaga. Does any, anybody remember Galaga from years ago? It, it, was, it is like the best game. You know, the, the way that the game is played, the sounds and the, 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 the stick, the button, the whole thing, it is just it is perfection. They cannot improve on that game. I don't care what you say about the games today. They can't improve on that game. And the object of the game was you had kind of a spaceship that you could move, and there were these mutant bugs, bees and different things that would come in formation. And once they got into formation, they would start coming down upon you and shooting at you. And you had to take your joystick and you had to shoot these bugs before they got on you. Now you got three ships. And so as they're starting to overpower you, and every level you went up, it would get harder and harder and harder. And then eventually what would happen is they would get your ship and it would go and then the next ship would come up. And you would play for a while, and then it would get your ship, and then the next ship would come up. And then when it got that last ship, you know what it cost you to play again? One quarter. One quarter. 
And buddy, I'll tell you, I took loads of money to the arcade. There are times that I spent a whole dollar right there on Galaga. <laughs> Today, we've got other games online. We've got Call of Duty. We've got other games that you can play online. You can get on Facebook, and you can, you can play games online. And most of the situations there are when you die in that game, you just start it up and you just play another game. There really isn't any cost to it. It might cost you a quarter in the old days. It might cost you nothing now. But I've got an idea. What would happen if we added an element to the game that in Galaga, when the mutant bugs blew you up, you actually got blown up? What if when you lost your life in a game, you actually, in reality, lost your life? I think that there would be an effect from this, don't you? I think that there would be an effect. I think that you would have a lot less people playing those games, amen? <laughs> and the ones that did, because you know that there would still be those that would play them, the ones that did would approach those games with a new sense of seriousness because the cost now had become so great. If we look at the church in America and we look at the church in the first century, we see a very big difference. The difference is this. The church in America, to be a follower of Christ in America today, even today, there is not much cost to follow Jesus. But the church in the first century, there was the potential of great cost to be a follower of Jesus Christ. This morning we are going to look at Acts chapter number 4. And as we look at Acts chapter number 4, we see two apostles, Peter and John, who were willing to put everything on the table. They were willing to put their whole life on the table, understanding that it could possibly mean that they would be called upon to pay the highest cost. Remember last week we talked about the lame beggar being healed there outside the courts of the temple. And all the people began to be amazed at this healing that took place. And we said last week that Peter took the opportunity to begin to preach the gospel to the people. He had this great crowd. A great miracle had taken place. Everybody was amazed. And Peter stepped up and he began to preach the gospel. He began to tell them, this is all about Jesus. Jesus raised this lame man up from being crippled and made him whole and well and he's running and jumping and praising God in the temple. Jesus is who did that. And by the way, you crucified Jesus and you need to repent. And he talked to them about the resurrection. He talked to them about the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection that we will experience as followers of Jesus. And then the word got back to the ruling authorities. And it ticked them off. It ticked them off not so much because they didn't like Jesus, but it ticked them off because it made them look bad. You see, they were the ones that instigated Jesus' death. Pilate put him to death, but it was the religious leaders behind the scene that said he must die. And now Peter is saying that these religious leaders were actually fighting against God because this Jesus who was crucified, he was the Messiah. And you killed him and we put him in the tomb and he wouldn't stay dead. And so now they're preaching this Jesus and it's making these religious leaders look really bad. It's making them look like they are enemies against God. And they truly were enemies against God, but they didn't want to look like that. And so they had to stop it. They had to confront it. They had to say, this can't happen. And so they sent people to arrest Peter and John. In Acts chapter 4, verse number 1, here's their story. 
And the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John because it was evening and they put them into jail for the next, to the next day. But many who heard the message believed and the number of the men grew to be about 5,000. And the next day the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there and so was Caiaphas. John, Alexander and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them and here's what they said. By what power or what name did you do this? And then we come to verse number 8. Now listen to the truth and the power of verse number 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's say that together. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, by whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone that you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved, Peter says. And when they saw the courage, the boldness, the fearlessness of Peter and John, they realized that they were unschooled and ordinary men. They were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there before them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred with each other. And there's what they said. What are we going to do here to these men? Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle, and we can't deny it. But to stop these things from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer anymore in this name. And the Bible goes on to say, and then they, they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. And after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who had miraculously been healed was over 40 years old. And on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. As we started this series of sermons, we said that we were going to go through the book of Acts and we were going to look at all of the instances where there was a conflict of power, a confrontation of power, where the kingdom of God came into confrontation with the kingdom of darkness. And that's exactly what we see here today. This is not just the religious rulers getting upset because they felt embarrassed but as we've said in the past, we've got to understand that the, the, the way these things work is you have a natural, physical thing going on, but behind that thing there is a spiritual dynamic. And the spiritual dynamic that is happening is the demonic behind it all is saying, we want Peter and John to shut up about Jesus. There was a spiritual class, clash that was going on 
behind the scenes. There was a power struggle between the demonic and the apostles. Again, there was a political perspective of the rulers that was going on, but it is demonic in nature. The demonic using the rulers as mouthpieces to speak out words to intimidate and to push back and to push down the people of God who have been called out to take the gospel. But the demonic tries to push back by fear and intimidation to get the people of God to sit down and shut up. That's exactly what was happening here. It's exactly what's happening in America as our political leaders, including Joe Biden, are being used as mouthpieces of Satan to spew intimidation across the land. And right now it's a very political orientation that is happening. But church, I'm telling you what, very soon it is going to turn on the church, and we better understand that. There is a demonic intimidation that is going on here in the fourth chapter of Acts, and there is a demonic intimidation that is coming across America and all across the world. There is going to be a turning point where all of a sudden, and I'm actually shocked that it hasn't happened yet, there's going to be a turning point where all of a sudden there is going to be a focus upon the church. And there are going to be things said about the church like we are bigots, we are hateful to homosexuals, we are hateful to tra transgenderism. We have a book that says salvation is only through Jesus Christ and Him alone, which is hateful to other religions that are also making claims in the same way. Church, you see, we are a body that has been established by God. We have been given salvation that has been bought for us through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been given the Word of God, and God has told us to live by it. And the demonic spirits that oppose us are going to try to intimidate us in every way. They're going to try to lie about us. They're going to try to, to frame us in a certain way. They're going to try to characterize us in a certain way. They're going to try to demonize us, if you will. And they're going to make us want to be those that shrink back and fall back and say, I don't want any trouble and I, I don't want to be punished and I don't want to be called names and I don't want to feel bad. And I'll just be quiet and I'll just sit over here and mind my own business. But if we do that, we are being obedient to the spirit of the world and not the spirit of God. The Spirit of God calls us to go forth not in anger, not in hate, not in harshness, in gentleness, but with truth, and to boldly speak the truth no matter what the cost. Everybody say amen. amen. No matter what the cost. The church in America has misunderstood the words of Jesus Christ. We spoke about that was a, a few weeks ago. We remember Jesus told the disciples, He said, I want you to go in Jerusalem away because the Holy Spirit is coming. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. Now, oftentimes in America, the way that we have interpreted what Jesus said was that there would be coming a time where the Spirit of God will indwell people and indwell us, and what will happen will be amazing things. And that is true. Amazing things happen. The Spirit of God gives us gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God works miracles through us. The Spirit of God does amazing things through us. But that's not all Jesus was talking about. When Jesus says, the Spirit of God will give you power and you will be my witnesses. What Jesus was talking about is what we saw right here this morning in Acts chapter number 4, where Peter and John were able to go boldly and stand before people that had the power to put them in jail, had the power even to take their lives. 
Yes, the Jews didn't have the power to put people to death directly. They had to do that through Rome, but they got that done pretty well with Jesus, didn't they? They could also do it with anybody else. So when Peter and John stood before them, there was a risk that was happening. But it's exactly what Jesus had promised. You will receive power, and you will then be able to be my witnesses. You'll be able to stand before authorities. You'll be able to stand even if there's cost involved. And you'll be able to do it in courage. You'll be able to do it in boldness to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody say amen. amen. Most of us have not really in this life, in our Christian walk, most of us have not really been tested. You know, when we talk about something as being tried and tested, you know, you, you, can, you can look at a chair. I mean, you don't know that chair is going to hold you up until you sit down in it a couple times, and then you're pretty convinced it's not going to break under your weight. And so that chair has been tried and tested. It's going to be able to do what it has been created to do. Well, many of us, many of us in this American Christianity that we have, we've not been tried and tested. We've experienced some of the difficult things of life. All of us have experienced <clears throat> heartbreak. All of us have experienced people that we love who have passed from this life, and it has been very painful and very hard. We've experienced a lot of things that we've had to really lean on Jesus about. But I would venture to say that most of us in this room have never had to put our lives on the line for Jesus Christ. We've never truly been tried and tested in that way. And in one part, we would say, that's great. I'm glad I live in America. I don't necessarily want to go through those things. And I don't necessarily want to go through those things either. And so part of that is a blessing that we've never had to experience those things. But there's another part of it that we're missing out on something. We're missing out on that aspect of knowing that we have stood there, we have planted our feet, we have looked difficulty and even death in the eye, and we have not surrendered our faith, we have not shrunk back, we have not turned in fear, but we have stood boldly and would not deny the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's a blessing in being tried and tested in this way. As we look at this passage in Acts chapter number 4, there are four or five things that stand out to me in this passage. And it's related to the idea of God testing us, of God allowing us to go through a testing time. Now, none of us know what is coming in America. I'm hoping that what happens is that, that all of this passes, great revival comes, the church grows, and we praise God and worship God until the day I die. That's what I hope happens. But I don't know that there might be a turn that takes place. And God allows America to go through a time where the church in America is tried and tested. I don't know that's not going to come. As a matter of fact, if God doesn't do something, I'm pretty sure it is going to come at some point. And so as we think about this in relation to Acts chapter number 4, what we saw in Peter and John, I want to share this. That if God allows us to be tested, it will be to teach us that we can trust Him alone. Now, it's great to live in America, but one of the fallbacks, one of the, one of the negatives about living in America is we have so much provided for us, there's so much we don't need to trust God for. And the church in America has gotten so used to, to not calling on God that we might be surprised if, if we come into a difficult situation whether or not we know how to do that. And so it's a great blessing if God would allow us to be tested and teach us that He truly can be trusted all alone, all by Himself. God can be trusted. We all have things in our life that prop us up. We all have things in our life that we have relied upon when we go through difficult times. Sometimes there's people in our life. Sometimes there's other things that happen. 
But there are times where God, out of His kindness, and it won't seem like kindness, but sometimes God, out of His kindness, will slap those things away and say, I want you to stand. And I want you to recognize you only need me. I've told you before that I've listened to Rush Limbaugh for 30 years. One of the things I liked about Rush is since I come from a conservative perspective, I believe in the Constitution, I believe in the things that have made America great. And Rush would talk about those things. And there were people that would spend a lot of time on newscasts and on the internet just, just talking about things that are absolutely contrary to what I believe and contrary to the Word of God. And so often you can feel like you're overpowered, like you're outnumbered, like you're all alone. But when, you, when I listened to Rush Limbaugh, there was some encouragement that would happen. And so as often as I could, when I was in the car in the afternoon, I would click on the radio, and there would just be encouragement that would take place when I would listen to him. And then he announced that he had lung cancer. I remember that broadcast when I heard that, and it just struck me like I had just heard that a friend had been diagnosed with lung cancer. And then I remember the day that he signed off on his very last broadcast. I was surprised by how much it affected me. And I remember the day where they had announced that he died. And his voice was gone. But I remember God saying, his voice is gone. But my voice is still here. And my voice is the only voice you need. Everybody say amen. amen. When Donald Trump was not reelected, millions of people in this country said, oh no, what's going to happen? Well, we know what's going to happen now, huh? And even those that hated Trump when he was in the office, those are now saying, you know, he wasn't all that bad. There were lots of good things about him. <clears throat> Didn't like some of the things he would say, and he was pretty bombastic, but as far as running the country, I think I, I, think I liked that direction more than I liked the direction now. And there were people that were saying, we must have Trump. And there were people that were holding out hope. Well, wait a minute, this is going to change, and that is going to change, and that is going to change, because we must have Trump. As much as I like Trump, i got to tell you, God is saying, you don't need Trump. I told you before, it's more important who sits on the throne in heaven than who sits in the Oval Office in the White House. God is, will, will teach us through testing as He strips away all these things that we have propped ourselves up with. God will teach us through testing that all we need is Him. We don't need anything else. He has been trying to teach believers that for years and years and years and years. He tried to teach the kings of Israel that for years and years and years. He tries to teach us what is in Psalm 33, 16, where it says this, No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance, despite all its great strength that cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear Him, on those whose hope is in His unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. May Your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in You. This is the heart of God that He wants to teach every single one of us. And yes, there are times in our life where He's going to slap away those things that we have been using to prop ourselves up. And He's going to say, I'm the only one you need. I'm the only voice you need. Trust me alone. And that's one of the things that testing, if God allows us to be tested, that's one of the things He's going to teach us. He's going to teach us that we will be able to know 
that we only need Him alone. The second thing, if God allows us to be tested, it will be to show us the power of the Holy Spirit within. As I said, there is a, a great blessing to be tried and tested by God, for God to allow us to be tried and tested. The Apostle Peter, the same one that we see here in Acts chapter number 4, he wrote First and Second Peter. And here's what he wrote later from this time in Acts chapter 4, down the road a little bit. This is what Peter wrote. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in His great mercy, He has given us new birth through a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And listen to what Peter now says in verse number 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. In other words, you're being tested. And verse number 7 says, These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The Apostle Peter says this, when God allows us to be tested, when God allows us to go through the fire, it's not because He's punishing us. It's because He is refining us. He is causing our faith to rise up, to be shown to be genuine, to be real. This is exactly what is happening in Acts chapter 4 as Peter and John stands before the rulers, those that could put him in prison, those that could even arrange for their death. They stood up there before those authorities with courage and they stood there and their faith was proved genuine. They had been tested and now their faith is shown to be real. And it brought glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if they ever wondered in their heart, what will I do when everything is called for to be put on the table and I've got to put my life on the line, what will I do? You see, because they had been tried and tested, now they knew. They knew what was on the inside. They felt the power of the Holy Spirit giving them faith and giving them strength and giving them courage to be able to stand up in the face of all those things. You never know how a quarterback will do until he gets in the game and the ball is snapped and those big snorting linemen are running across the line wanting to crush him into powder. You never know how a quarterback is going to do until he gets in a real game. There's a lot of guys that are great in practice, but put them in a game and they fall apart. You find out what you're made of when you get in the game. You never know how a soldier is going to react. They've been trained. They've had weeks and weeks of training. They know how to use their gun. And it's only when they get into combat and bullets that are buzzing overhead do you really know what is inside of that soldier. And so there's a great blessing for God to allow us to be tried and tested because the, the power of the Holy Spirit will rise up on the inside of us and prove our faith to be genuine. Allowing us to be put on the line and trusting in the Holy Spirit and our faith then resulting in glory and honor before the Lord Jesus Christ when He returns. A third thing that I pull out of this passage in Acts chapter number 4 is that if God allows us to be tested, He will bring us to a whole new level of prayer. How many have recognized in your own life when you go through difficult times, you pray a little better? Anybody ever notice that? You get a little bit more serious about prayer when trouble comes into your life. And none of us like trouble, but let's just face it. There are times where God will use trouble in our life to strip away the things that don't need to be there and to bring us to a place of seriousness 
And there is, there is this, this thing that happens. When trouble comes into our life, our prayers get much more serious. As a matter of fact, if we never go through any trouble in this life, we may never really truly learn how to pray. But it's when we're in a situation that is very difficult that we just throw everything that aside. We get before God and we don't worry about words and we don't worry about form. And all we do is we just pour out our heart before this God that loved us so much. And we learn that that's what true prayer is. It's not impressing everybody around us. It's not the right form of the prayer. It's not reading a prayer. It is calling up from the inside those emotions and desires and and things that rumble around on the inside of the heart. And we just blast them out to God. And we say, God, here I am. This is who I am. I'm afraid. This is what I need. And all of a sudden, prayer is raised up to a whole different level. What you're going through right now may not be because God is punishing you. It may be because God is teaching you and He's calling you into a new level of relationship, a new level of prayer. When Peter and John were released, they went back to the church and they began to tell the church what had happened. Now, everybody understood something in that moment. They understood that there there had been a change There was a change in the air. They could feel the change in the air. Peter and John weren't punished. They were locked up for a night. But but these these rulers, they wanted to punish them. And it was coming. There was coming a time where a guy named Stephen would be in a similar situation. And he would begin to preach. And the people would drag him out and stone him to death. This was in the air. They could feel it. They knew something had changed. They knew now there was a cost to following Jesus. It wasn't just, isn't this great hanging out with the believers? There was now a cost to following Jesus. They recognized there was a certain risk. They recognized that even their children had a certain risk. They recognized that this now will affect the future. It was going to get hard now from this point. And their minds were filled with questions about what would happen next. And that's exactly what we would be thinking as well. And they were afraid. They began to pray in a whole new level because they felt the power of the Holy Spirit energizing their prayers. Acts 4 and 23 says this, On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they they all raised their voices together in prayer. And they said, Sovereign Lord, You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of Your servant, our father David. He said, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against His anointed one. They go on then in verse 27. He said, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. And then God, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand that should happen. And now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness and stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And the Word of God goes on and it says, and after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. Now let me ask you a question about their prayer. Did you notice that there was something missing from their prayer? Did you notice that they didn't include asking God to protect them? 
they didn't include a prayer for safety. They prayed for God to give them the power to keep speaking in the face of this threat. And they prayed for God to keep working with miracles and signs and wonders confirming that word as they went forward. They prayed not for their safety, but for the mission of God to be completed on the earth. You see, when testing comes, it brings the church into a whole new level of prayer. It brings the church into a new level of of interaction with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was praying up out of them. And it did not include protection. It included the mission of God and the courage and the boldness of the people of God. This is the heart of God. If God tests us, if He allows us in America to be tested, the Spirit of God will rise up on the inside of us and lead us and guide us into boldness and courage in the face of authority and bring us to a whole level of intimacy and prayer and interaction with Almighty God because all of a sudden the stakes have gotten very, very high and the people of God will get very, very serious. The fourth thing, if God allows us to be tested in America, it will answer the question that many of us have asked. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I know this to be true. For those that, are, that are, are serious followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, some point in our life, we have asked ourselves the question, if we are ever placed or allowed to be in an impossible situation, what would we do? Would we remain faithful to God? We hear the stories years ago about the school shootings. And some of those stories have come back to us where, where evil people have walked into schools with guns and they've placed, they put a gun on, 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 a, on one of the students and said, oh, you're a Christian, deny Jesus. And they would not do it and they pulled the trigger. So many of us have read those stories and watched those reports and we've asked ourselves, if I was ever in that situation, Would I be able to have the courage and the strength and the boldness to not deny the Lord Jesus Christ? Would I be able to do that? If God allows us to be tested, He will allow us to understand what is on the inside of us. In Revelation chapter 12, verse number 11, here's what it says. They overcame Him. They overcame Him. They overcame all the powers of the enemy. They overcame Satan. They overcame the demonic. They overcame the Antichrist. They overcame the kingdom of darkness. They overcame him by the blood of the land. And what else? By the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. We don't like that kind of preaching in America. We want to hear how we can increase our bank accounts and have a successful life. We don't like this kind of preaching. Church, in a few months or years from now, we may not have a choice of whether or not we like it. We we may be in a situation like we've never been before in our lives or in the history of America. I don't know that that's going to happen, but I know that it's happened all around the world. Why wouldn't it happen to the church in the United States of America? Not as a punishment, but as a blessing of God. I know that's hard to get our American minds around, but as a blessing of God to allow us an opportunity to stand in the middle of the fire and say, God, my faith is genuine. My faith has been tried and tested, and it has proven to be real. Now, here's a key. We're looking at Peter in chapter number 4. 
And he's a man of courage. He's a man of faith. He's preaching the word of God in the face of death. Not very long ago, there was a different Peter, although it's the same Peter, same guy, but a different guy. Same guy, but different guy. And this guy, when Jesus was arrested, a little slave girl came up to him and said, hey, weren't you with Jesus? And this same Peter said no, and he did it three times. And he even cursed. He cussed. Get away from me. You don't know what you're talking about. I don't even know him. That's what Peter said. But in Acts chapter number 4, he stands up and he says, you guys decide, is it right to obey you or obey God? In other words, do with us what you may. We're going to serve God. We're going to speak the things that we have heard and seen. We're going to do what he wants us to do. You, you decide what you want to do to us, but we've already decided what we're doing for God. What happened between that story in the Gospels where, where Peter denied Jesus and Acts chapter number 4? There's, there's one simple thing that's happened, and that is that he's been filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? He's been filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, church, in this last question, this last thing, if God ever allows us to be tested, it'll answer that question that we have had. What would I do if I was put in an impossible situation? And here's how we can prepare for it. And Jesus has told us very simply how we can prepare for it. He said this. He said that if you're going to follow me, you've got to take up your cross and follow me. He says, he says you've got to die first. You've got to die to self. And so in other words, what Jesus is saying is this. Before you ever get to any situation where the, where the stakes are big and the cost is very large, before you ever get to that place, way over here, you die. You die. Because if you die here to your own self-ambition, if you die here to your sin, if you die here to, to your own wants and selfishness, if you die here, if you ever come into that place where God allows you to be in a place where you have to lay it all on the table, you put your line on the table, your life on the table, you know what's going to happen? It's already been decided back there. It's already been decided back there. And so back here, we die to self, and we seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We make this decision. We're dying to ourself. We want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we walk through this life with people that have nothing to lose and everything to gain no matter what happens, whether they give us a million dollars in a blue ribbon or whether they take our lives, we win. We cannot be beat. And all of it, in the end, when Jesus returns, will be to His praise and glory and honor because we will have not just said we believed in Him, but we will have demonstrated that our faith is real. Our faith is genuine because there is nothing more important in our life than our obedience and our relationship to the one who has hung on the cross for us to save us from our sins. Would you stand? Worship team, come on back.